Hey guys, how are you? This is Ishai Breslauer, your host of the CRE Shark Eye Show. And as you guys know, uh, sometimes it's prop tech time. And you know how close to prop tech I am. And I have two people here who are prop tech. That's what they are. They are all prop tech uh, from the day we started. And uh, with us, we have Louisa Dickens and Zan Winterton. Uh, we'll talk to both of them. Louisa is uh, more on the founding. She's a founding partner of this uh, of this company, which I and I met her years ago. Years ago, I met her at, at a conference and one of the first MIPIM conferences, which is a conference obviously for PropTech for you guys who don't know what it is. Uh, and uh, it was exciting to hear about her plans. And at the time, I was. Uh, uh, just starting at the space, it was really exciting. And Zan is the rep, is the man of New York now. And I uh, would love to hear how is New York for Zan, how New York is treating him and how is he doing there. But uh, first of all, thank you guys for being with us. I really appreciate your time. Awesome. Well, um, shall I start then? Um, I guess Corey, you, one... you know what? Give us a two minute, first of all, like, let's, let's, you know, give us a two-minute elevator pitch of what is LMRE. For sure. Uh, but also, I just want to first of all say uh, thank you so much for having us on the Shark Eye. I need to get you on uh, the podcast myself. Um, quick elevator pitch of LMRE. Well, for those listening who don't know who we are, we are a specialist property technology recruitment firm. What is property technology? Property technology could be anything within commercial, anything in construction, smart buildings, residential technology. And we have operations across North America, UK, Europe, and APAC. Uh, who do we hire for? Well, we hire for anything from a pre seed to post IPO tech company within real estate. Uh, some of them may be the likes of VTS, a census, uh, open space. You can see it's a uh, uh, different stages of development, different products as well, different solutions. We also are hire for the big real estate technology businesses um, or investment managers. It could be a Blackstone, LaSalle, JL Technologies, uh, PGM, and we'll be hiring those innovation, those data, those product professionals, which they are in such high demand now. And then we also partner with the likes of Fifth Wall and Metaprop and help them tie in their portfolios. So it's all things around recruitment, all things around talent, all things around businesses scaling. And one thing which I've learned since setting LMRE up is that uh, recruitment is on every founder's mind. It's on my mind as well. We're a team of 50, but my God, it has taken wow. a long time to get those 50 core cool people. But we have some great people in the business like wonderful Zan, uh, who is joining us on the podcast too. But um Zan, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit as well? And then I'll give a background to, I guess, why, why we started at LMRA. Right, ahead, Zan. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah. So thanks again for, for having me on here, Yashai. Uh, so yeah, so I'm Zan Winston. I'm the Managing Director of North America at LMRE. And I, uh, so I've been at the company for, for two and a half years. And I was actually introduced to Louisa through through a friend when I was out here last in, in New York. So I previously worked at actually a cybersecurity startup called Tessian, uh, which I joined in London. <clears throat> and I worked there for, for a year and we got back by Sequoia Capital. And with that funding, uh, we sort of went to, to the US. And for some reason, they asked me to, to join the head of sales to help set up operations <laughs> there. <laughs> and... Um, anyway, I was, I was working sort of on the sales side and operations and love, love technology, but I was, I was actually more interested in the people side and had a few friends in recruitment and got introduced to, to, to LMRE, Louisa and, and Richard, and they said that they were looking to, to really develop and expand uh, on sort of existing client base uh, in North America. And after hearing the pitch, I was immediately bought in and uh, joined the business and, and sort of we've been growing pretty, pretty dramatically ever since. How could you not get um, excited about them? And uh, <laughs> now, you're part of the now you're a part of But the do you know, do you know what I find like too shocking? So we like, if you look at, I guess those are saying, if you look at PropTech, the North American technology scene is so far ahead 
of what's happening in Europe and in APAC as well. So some, I'm banging my head against like the wall. I'm like, why did I start in the UK? But um, Sam joining, it's uh, we're now seeing more clients from our um, our new, not even new anymore, clients in the US now all scaling across to Europe and now others sort of looking at APAC. So it's been extremely interesting uh following the trends and the growth of these businesses and watching the m a but um no it's uh loving in this industry and those listening in to this from obviously maybe the shows like fintech friends and um, definitely check it out because it's um it's a cool space to be in it is and i'll tell you something well you just mentioned about you know in america of course it's, it's still the rome of our time everybody's talking about change of times change of the imperial, I guess, the imperial ship, you know, um, mm. et cetera. But it's still America without a doubt. And, um, and uh, yeah, and that's where Jan, I guess, is there in order to get the most out of that market. But the global aspect is very much there, and I would like to discuss it in a second. But before we get there, mm. Louisa, let's go back in time into the point where you and Richard started this thing. What got into your head and how, what, what, you know what, let's go even further back to your career in order to understand what got you to this point. Yeah, for sure. So I went to university. I studied geography over here in the UK. If you study geography, you go into real estate and geography. You look at obviously there's the uh, social side of it. There's environmental side. So without knowing when I studied that, I was going to be interested in obviously property and technology, because as we've seen and read, all the effects of climate change on the built environment. So uh, somehow I actually didn't even realize, but I was already interested in this space. But um, Richard and I uh, were building a real estate exec search firm that focused on hiring traditional uh, real estate folk into the Jones Angler Sales, the CBREs, the Savills and Knight Frank. Now, my brother is an asset manager in real estate and I was catching up with him one time after work and I Jenny was baffled at how he went about his day-to-day about using technology and um, he started saying hey you need to check out these products one was um demand logic one was smart spaces I mean there's some are in the US some aren't but I went and spoke to these like founders and I Jenny was like I was like this is the future how are these real estate folk going to do their day-to-day jobs most cost efficiently um and like quickly without using this technology so then i said hey there's definitely um there's definitely gonna be a growth in this market same thing as fintech so i'd go to some cool conferences out there we had the likes of obviously shout out to michael beckman's Cretech, the mip and ones which were and when i met some more cool founders across all verticals and said hey i speak to these founders they are all struggling to find that talent to grow their their own product but also all my old clients from my traditional real estate recruitment days, the JL, CBREs and so forth, all their HR were like, we keep uh, being told that we need to hire data professionals, uh, engineering people. They'd be like, well, how, where do we hire them? So we started getting new mandates to hire this whole new skill set into real estate. Um, we are being asked some questions about how do you um, make the business more, I guess, culturally aligned to these new remote uh, professionals and new technologists of the world and luckily we did that in 2018 so four years of traditional real estate recruitment pivoted in 2018 and my god it was the best thing I ever did we had a year to really get out and go to all these events like I mentioned before Michael Beckham was very kind to me and let me co-host dinners the likes of JB at Camber Creek and Zig at uh, and David Zig Capital who all gave me these introductions and the understanding of how big and vast this space could be and already was then we went to lockdown and obviously as we've all spoken about and heard in every single webinar uh COVID has uh I guess forced the real estate world to digitalize adopt products but also a flow of investment going into this space and good thing for that is that I'm sure we saw loads of them, people in the traditional real estate world, unfortunately, lose their jobs during COVID. You know, people were furloughed. Some people haven't all come back, but we've seen a massive growth and we can share some data on this later of people with these new skills, these new, uh, like I said, the data scientists, the engineers, the real estate staff people. So where there's been jobs lost, there's been new, uh, more new techie, if you like, jobs uh, created 
So that's a bit about it. I love it. I love meeting new people. And I love learning about a new product every single day. And but I am sick of using the word prop tech, but and so are my friends, but but I'm sure there's new a phrase will coin sometime soon. I think I think the story is so amazing. And when I think back at it, I remember now I remember when we met at that conference. And mm. I was asking, and uh, it, with some people I had very short conversations, and obviously I don't remember them. And some people I had a long conversation with you. I had a very long conversation because you came and said, I think that we're coming to revolutionize this whole uh, industry called prop tech because we're coming and there's placements going to be needed, et cetera. And, and I was thinking because, you know, when you train yourself to think I'm also coming from real estate, I'm a real estate mm-hmm. guy, I'm a commercial real estate guy. But when you come into prop tech, you start pivoting your brain to start thinking in an innovative way. Right. And then Mm -hmm. someone's telling you, listen, I want to come and disrupt the market with placement. And you're thinking there's nothing much to place at this point. What is going to be? They're probably seeing something I don't. And you obviously did. And uh, and it's amazing with 50 people in the company, with uh, with the global touch that you have to have with how much prop tech, how far and wide prop tech reached. That's amazing. And you reached New York. And that leads me to Zan. Zan, (laughs) New York City, man. And uh, you you probably uh, are, uh, you know, already getting the culture, getting the vibe, getting the rhythm of Manhattan. Uh, tell us a little bit about that transition of going to Manhattan and dealing with the, with the big real estate guys. Tell us a little bit about that experience. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, what's interesting is that I was I was here obviously a couple of years ago before before COVID. So I left in, in 2019 and then joined LMRE. For, for about three months and then and then spent the first sort of six six to nine months uh sort of holed up at home so it's it's definitely changed new york um in in many ways but there's been a real i guess real resurgence of, of the city over the last uh sort of four or five months i mean if you look at the the residential space especially it's so competitive mm-hmm. out here to, to trying to get apartments so i think people are flooding back uh, to the city, which is super exciting. And New York for us, you know, it is the epicenter of, of the prop tech sector, um, you know, globally. And, you know, when we first started off, and I think what's interesting that's that's changed uh, over the course of the, these two years is that at first it was, you know, New York, a little bit in San Francisco and in Texas. But the change that we've seen with the, with the clients we're working with as a result of COVID is just a massive spread of, of companies that are spinning up across all states. And I think that's opened a lot of opportunities for companies from a hiring perspective. No longer are you required to just find people in these pockets of, of New York, you know, Boston, San Francisco, but because people are remote working, you have the ability to tap into people who are very skilled and also potentially at a lower price point. Um, And that's allowed us to also engage with a much wider uh, group of of uh, of startups and and technology businesses, um, which has been great. And as as Louisa says, we've we've learned a lot along the way. You know, every time we you know, we see, you know, uh, an investment round or, you know, when we're working with the likes of Metaprop, we're coming across a new technology that disrupts another sector and we have to learn about it. We have to, you know, engage with founders to understand what they're doing. But I think, um, you know, New York's an interesting place. It's, I would say it's, it's, it's like London, but on steroids, you know, it's, 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 it's more competitive. It's noisier. It's yeah. a hell of a lot hotter at the moment. Uh, yeah. But that is, but there is that feeling of like, you know, if you work hard, you can really make it here. And I think what's nice, especially about the, you know, the sector that we're in is that because real estate is, it has always and will always be a very relationship driven market is that, yes. um, you know, people are very willing to introduce you to, to other people in the sector. You know, and if you're willing to give them time uh, to, to listen to what they're doing, I think that's very much reciprocal. And that's been a massive thing for, for us, as, as Louisa mentioned, you know, the likes of Michael Beckerman, you know, um, JB, you know, Aaron, you know, all, all these people have given us time, especially early doors when we were a small business. Mm. And I think, you know, you know we'll, we're forever grateful for that. And I think that's something that 
we're now as a larger business trying to trying to be a part of as well so getting people together for drinks or dinners or whatever it is you know getting people to events that potentially aren't currently going to real estate tech conferences and also educating people who are outside of the industry because i think ultimately That's very important. Benefits. yeah yeah um That's but so far new york it's been going well i want to ask you something just Suzanne. just one last question how was it setting up the office Meaning setting up an <laughs> office from scratch, not easy. Tell us just a little bit about that. Dang. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely not easy. I viewed a lot of a lot of different offices running up and down New York. Um, but we finally got one in, in FIDI, uh, which is set up in a flex flex office space, which is fantastic. And uh, cheap. So yeah. FIDI today yeah. is a deserted area. You know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we, we're doing well, um, so we've got yeah. a good, we've got a good price point for it. We've obviously we know the space quite well, so we were able to to haggle down the the brokers a little bit, which is always good fun. So yeah, no, it was definitely a challenge, but I'm glad we've got a spot now. Okay, beautiful. Shifting gears a little bit, back to Louisa. Uh, Louisa, I want to talk a little bit about yeah, meaning your business started in the UK. You guys are in the UK. Obviously, you have now a more of a global reach, but. I want to talk about that global reach. I want to talk about that global aspect of PropTech. If you could talk to us how and when you found out that, you know, PropTech is so far and wide that you have to reach all over the place. And uh, please tell us how you see the development firsthand from your, of PropTech, of this whole industry in terms of the countries, in terms of all over the world, in terms of what you see the technologies that are coming in and out all over the world, because it's not only UK. It's not only New York, Israel, of course, obviously. But it, I'm saying mm. it's, it's like all over now. Tell us a little bit about what you hear and see. Yeah. Well, I think it's like the obvious, the most amount and the the largest valuations, the largest amount of investments are all coming out sort of North America with, I mean, we all know the brands there as well. Uh, the hotspots where we've sort of been set up and we're seeing a huge amount of growth. Obviously, London is the, probably the big one for Europe if we even count the UK part of Europe, I guess some people don't, and technically isn't. But then we've seen a huge growth in Berlin, uh, Paris, and people usually go, if they're going to set up, they go UK, they go Berlin, they then go Paris. Uh, we're seeing some growth, and actually a couple of unicorns coming out of Southern Europe, but yet again, there's still sort of the lower valuations and low investments there. In terms of APAC, I think that's been the most interesting one in, over the past like few years. Hong Kong was a place for people to launch and set up. Now with everything that's happening there, it's either Singapore or it's um, or it's Sydney. And then we've seen quite a lot of growth come out of Japan. Uh, but it's also, it's like depending on, um, uh, there's different verticals of prop tech where, so in Australia, there's more stuff coming out around sort of the contact. Singapore's really looking at sort of ESG. I'd say in terms of smart buildings, um, and when it comes down to climate tech, obviously Europe is very much leading the way. They had loads of regulations even before COP twenty um, COP twenty six. So it's it really sort of de it depends on what we're looking at. There's so many different like uh, factors. I think what Zan can elaborate on is basically the main areas which we've been sort of operating where we've seen growth, and then potentially I can go into what we're looking at in terms of major growth areas, um, in terms of investment, and a few companies as well. Okay, so we're back. We lost connection for one second. Louisa, uh, what is what are really the most exciting aspects of PropTech today with all the industries that you have today? Because you have, uh, you know, you have the PropTech contains so many things. It contains fintech, can say construction tech, the property management management aspect, the AI for big data to to find projects, to source projects. It's endless. What is the most exciting thing or, pro or, or industry within the prop tech today? Um, well, I have to be very careful not to be biased to my clients because obviously I love every <laughs> vertical of property technology. Um, I'd have to say it goes back to obviously I did my dissertation within climate change. So I think uh, the climate tech area is super, well, I think it's very early stage, which I find interesting there's only a couple of products out there which kind of have proof of product which are growing you have the measurables um which is obviously matt, matt Tony's he's also written a book on esg which those are something you should definitely read it's taught me a huge amount and then you have uh the deep heats of vincent which is all about sort of asset management 
Um, but it's such an early stage. And I think for us as a business, we need to follow a sector which is getting a lot of man investment, which is happening even though a recession is looming um, due to certain client regulations, much more awareness of this, uh, building owners, operators, all having to release data on this, which also then uh, brings on to the smart buildings. It's like, how do they measure this data? Now you can do it with some of those companies, but they'll also need to partner with the likes of say VergeSense and other smart building uh solutions so they can really work out what their energy emissions are i think another sector which is interesting because i live in london you guys are recording from new york uh construction is bloody everywhere and in 2020 i read on uh, i think it was TechCrunch or something so hopefully a reliable resource um they had a record breaking year 1.3 billion total from funding which is 56 56 percent growth on the uh three years before now that's massive but like, um, if you think oh, after the pandemic, sort of forced construction still, well, they still wanted it to carry on to obviously meet so many issues too with, um, I guess, housing, affordable housing. So how else can you do that efficiently? How else can you make it cheaper? How can you make it quicker? And that's all through contact. And you've seen growth of, um, I guess, Procore's, I guess, one of the biggest ones out there. You have the Trimble, the, you know, the sort of first generation software companies, but then some really cool solutions like Open Space and Onsite IQ, which are really changing the way you um, develop and build. And own construction, most people don't count construction in prop tech. I do, but within that whole supply chain, there's so many different areas of it, which people don't even realize that could, uh, there's like 100%. a solution to it. But where I think, will be super interesting. And this is actually what we, um, we met a load of cool businesses at Realcom that do this. It's basically a product that will integrate all the solutions and help out with implementation. And that's what all these real estate owners and asset managers and so forth businesses want because they don't want to have to deal with so many different technology products. They just want it simple, easy, give us the value and integrate it so we don't have like a, another headache. So that's why I think for us, it's, around climate tech, it's around contact, it's around sort of smart buildings. Um, but I think climate tech, climate tech on a just a general sort of personal interest, um, I'm sort of really, um, uh, I guess, doing a bit more research on. Um, Zan, thank you for that, Louisa. It's really well, what an overview it was. I think it was very, very insightful. Uh, taking everything Louisa said, and I would take it globally, but Zan, you came from London, you came from the UK, and you landed in New York, um, and you're starting to learn, obviously, you are in the middle of the whole prop tech industry over there. What did you say different in New York in terms of prop tech, in terms of the types of technologies that we've been discussed right now all over the world in, the nut mm. in New York? What's going on there? Yeah, I think that I think that there are many similar trends that 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 we see coming into into New York and the US that 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 then trickle down into into Europe. I would say that this this tends to be the the the, the location where ideas are created, potentially not on the on the ESG side, but if we look look at like commercial real estate data, um, you know solutions or flex office providers or the sensor um industry that 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 louisa touched upon you know all of these have pro proliferated out of the us so i'd say that the 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 size and the scale and speed at which these these um platforms come to market is much quicker and that's really as mm -hmm. a result of you know a the the funding that that, that these startups are able to to uh, tap into, but also the total addressable market for them is 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 something that is is much more vast and a little bit less um, constricted than trying to work in Europe, for example. So you know, if you start in London as a as a business, you're looking at the UK market. If you then want to expand to to, to the rest of Europe, you need to have people that understand the regulations of Germany, be able to speak French, understand how you know Italian business works. And that's a real challenge. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the US, you know, you've got 360 million people that also <laughs> speak the same language. And, you know, often they're having common common problems. So I think, you know, a lot of the, the issues, well, I think a lot of the opportunity here um, does get replicated in, in, in Europe, but it just happens at a slower pace. And I think the same can be, you know, said for 
you know, the, the, the Israel prop to, Israeli prop tech scene, you know, we, we work with lots of Israeli prop techs that, that start in Israel uh, and their natural uh, route to market is once they've got their product and they've built it out in, in Israel is to come to the US because there's such that flow of technology. Um, and for them, that's the big market to, to really expand their business and, and put their name um, on their product. So I think that we see the trends, you know, coming from the US and they replicate in, mm. in UK and Europe. Um, it just takes more time. You know, I would say we're within the US. Go ahead, go ahead, Sorry, go ahead. I really want I really want to make a point that in the US, it's a cultural thing. US uh, people have a far bigger appetite for a risk. In the UK, we're a lot slower. We'd give like slow no's. I'd say in Germany, they're a lot more sort of direct. Uh, France is a hard market to break in, especially if you're not hiring to local people. In the US, they'll t- they have bigger budgets. They're more um, tech forward, if I can say it, but they are more uh happy to sort of take risks and businesses and if it doesn't work out it's fine they go into the next one so i completely get why businesses from whether it's israel or the uk or they their first market they want to go to and try and break through is the us because obviously the sheer size of it but the um there's a high chance that some will take hunt on them even if uh, their product's not completely ready by the way just to make make you guys understand um if you're saying that london is a little slower than new york city Israel, in terms of taking risk, is like over there. <laughs> so yeah, I know. People are, Which is amazing. People are insane. It's like the entrepreneur so, culture you have there. It's exactly. insane. It's, it's like it's like unbelievable. On every block, you have seven startups. Like from, it's, <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> and they all will fail, maybe, but they don't care. But anyway, uh, it's 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 uh, it's the insanity of, of the whole thing. I want to ask you something, Zan. Just go, leading from what you said. I want, I want to ask you a question. Okay, so we understand the idea that a lot of people come to New York, but there's one challenge. And and I think, Louisa, you also see it globally, and I would like to hear from you, but let's start with New York first and then go to the rest of the world. The go-to-market aspect, penetrating other markets. Let's say I started, Israel is not an example because Israel is is like, uh, that's why you call it the startup nation. Everything starts from here is automatically in the first place from the day one, from day one, it's geared to go to the US, Mm -hmm. Europe, doesn't matter. So it's not a great example, but I would take, let's say a startup that started in France or in Germany or in the UK or in the US, it doesn't matter. And they want to go to a different country. One of the challenges from your perspective, Zan, when you see those startups that are coming to New York and possibly telling you, I want to get in, how do I do that? Where you guys, how do you guys see it? Tell in yeah. New York, let's start with the New York perspective and then move to Louisa with a global perspective. And um, yeah, so I think that for do you mean from for going from New York to Europe or, or vice versa? No, no, I would, I would go going to New York because that's, Good. I guess, the main route, you know. Mm. That yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think the thought process, the, you know, what they have to go through. Uh, they think they have a great product. Now we're going to New York. What do we have to do? Yeah, so I think that from the first instance, it's really making sure that your product is going to work well within, let's say, the the, the real estate market, because it is run very differently. There are so many nuances, the way that business is done, even the technology that is used, that is different to what's going on in UK and Europe. And so I think at the first instance, it is very much possible for a UK or European-based startup to begin doing business in the US from their headquarters, And I think that's Mm -hmm. an important thing to start doing is to get, you know, some level of of revenue started before just saying, okay, we're going to open up an office and try and kickstart the business there. Because I think that's where, you know, some people, you know, come into challenges is that all of a sudden you've, you, you've tried to start up an office, you've just hired someone new and they've got the pressure of trying to start and, uh, you know, generate revenue in a market where no one knows who they are. But if you can build on you know, a few valuable logos and champions that really speak about your product, um, even before you've landed, I think that puts you in good stead uh, to get the ball rolling. And I think that that's a challenge from a product perspective. I think the other side 
is also you know, so important if you speak to loads of founders when they first open up uh, in new territories you know it's you, you might have a good product but you really need to have someone that that you fully believe in and that you get on well with mm. that you trust and who knows the market so i think it's a combination of one having someone that joins you know from your business to go out to 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 this new country to whether it's to new york um, but also finding someone who is really tapped in and dialed into your industry uh, to understand and be able to connect you with the right people, because you're going to be leaning on that person massively uh, to, to open the right doors and also ask the right questions. I think mm. sometimes startups um, run into this too quickly. And I think it's important, you know, during that interview process to open the doors to questions about your own business and what you've got planned because seeing it from the perspective of someone who is in New York, the conversations that they've had is going to be massively helpful for you in deciding, you know, what is the structure of what we're going to do and what is the strategy for our go-to-market plan when we open up? Because you only really get one shot. And yes, you can have iterations, but if you've got the problems at the start, that's really going to slow you down. So I'd say those are two key areas uh, that people often might overlook but they're the quickest way, I think, to, to, to have a successful launch in, in New York and the U.S. Thank you for that. And Louisa, for the global perspective, is it the same or is it? The- um, I, I, think, I think it's definitely the same. I think there's certain markets who, which are a lot tighter and difficult to break. I bring out the French market is notoriously difficult. They like working with uh, French companies and everything like that. There's, I think, a big thing. I think the market research is so key. I think making sure you have the correct value proposition is super key. But um, you can have like a case study, aka client, let's use, say, JLL if you're coming out of London and you're going to Berlin or if you're going to Singapore or you're going to New York. I don't, I think people always think, the same thing for our business as well. People always think, what's the next client I can get? No, if you get one good client or just nurture and build on that relationship, these businesses are so bloody big. But I think sometimes they get, if you've got a VC pressurizing you, or I don't know, even say if you're launching the business, your founder saying, right, you need to generate these new clients. It doesn't happen overnight. Any sort of relationships you have after you've done local market research, build on them, like Dan said, go do like a couple of trips. But it's so important to leverage off the relationships you have, whether it's recruitment, whether it's finance, whether it's tech, your friends. And yes, I am sure that I know this real uh, community. You guys are so close and you guys will only refer people that you like. You will probably only do business people that you like and trust. It's the same thing with all other industries, same thing in London, all New York. World, yeah. And that's what people often don't spend time doing. Like they want to run, they can walk. They don't know the market. They don't have the relationships. No one wants to do business with someone they don't trust and know. And also no one wants to do business with a product which isn't ready, um, ready for whatever issue they have. And I also think, going back to talking more general about the US market, people often go over that, but once you, if you do get that client going, the feedback we've had is that finally trial a new technology from Europe or whatever, and the business can't keep up with their demands those clients operate quickly they're bigger businesses more people the problem's larger and they screw it up because they don't actually their tech team can't deliver and can't make the amendments to the product as quickly as they need to um i'm speaking to mickey at eq office who obviously started working with rice buildings recently obviously not too recently required by vts Mickey was just like, Rise Buildings, Prasan, they were so quick to work with. They were brilliant, but they were super early stage, but they just responded, they listened, they acted. And that's basically, and did all the research. Mickey's like, that's a sign of a great product. And look at, like, passengers sold us, uh, you know, went through the MA recently, he's a happy man. And, but that just shows how easy it is to get right, how easy it is to get wrong. Thank you. Uh, I want to throw the following question to both of you guys. Um, you guys work with placement. You're experts. That's one of your expertise, main expertise. When you, I would say, look at the market today, what is the, I would say, give me an example of the few positions that are the most desirable in terms of the, the, the demand for those type of positions is like crazy. You can't find enough of those. What are, what are those yeah. positions? 
Yeah, Dan, I'll give um, I'll give some recent data points. I was just having a look at it for a presentation um, I did last week. So where's the demand? So supply and demand. Uh, well, there's not enough supply, hence why we're seeing loads of people coming from finance and finally prop tech's trying to get more, uh, uh, I guess, talent coming from different sectors, which is great. We saw a 40% increase in data roles uh, last year. Already that amount, that percentage is on the up, we're only half of the year. Yeah, data, data analysts, data scientists, tech, all, all things data. Then you've got the engineering. Now, engineering goes up every single year. It's and it's great because it's sector agnostic. It's always someone's got the great, right programming. That's like uh, that everyone listening in, no one's gonna no one's gonna be shocked by that. We, we saw a 20% increase in innovation roles, um, which is and that's obviously across the investment managers, the consultancies, the agencies, but then obviously the real estate SaaS, uh, everyone's looking for them as the prop tech scene grows. As um, businesses like JL Technology, Subaru Host are building products in-house, they need real estate software people. That was up 50% last year. But then a big thing as well is the ESG side. That's up 60%. These, you know, Blackstone, I think two years ago, didn't have a, a sustainable ESG team. They had two people two years ago. It was 12, I think, before Christmas. Now it's, it's these two, I mean, these businesses, it's a whole new set of like uh, talented, uh, new skilled individuals. And that's where we're seeing the largest growth. Sam can probably go into a bit more details. He's doing the placements and on the ground. I can answer yeah, any questions around that for you. I think one of the the areas that we're getting you know discussions from for startups which is fantastic is on on the diversity side. Um, so you know, mm. getting more you know women into you know into prop tech. Um, you know, also from uh, different backgrounds. I think that you know finding. Or getting strong, you know, female sales leaders into the space. You know, they're, they're they're really hard to come by, but they're in really high demand, and it's great to be having these conversations. And I think that comes from you know the education of the industry. If you look at the the fintech market, there's still so much work to be done there, but it's changed dramatically over the last mm. ten years. And I think that you know. PropTech uh, is still, you know, early on in its uh, in its journey um, in development, but I think that we're working hard with a number of, of clients that have got that as a top priority for them: diversity of culture, diversity of gender, um, and it's. I think it's also, you know, if it's overlooked, you just you don't get the diversity of thought within your business, which is really important. You know, I think that. You know, we, we speak about a potential slowdown um, in, you know, coming up, you know, whether that will happen. Uh, we're not too sure. I wanted sure, to ask but, you about that, guy. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that <laughs> that's when you need to have people in your business that are going to challenge the status quo. And if you've got everybody who's from the same school, looks the same, they're going to be having the same ideas. And so that's why it's imperative to have people that are coming from different backgrounds to give you a different perspective and help you become innovative or more innovative uh, than you already are. So that's a real focus area for us at the moment. There was also, we did a, um, we've done like a few questionnaires recently and those who do not have a, a diverse uh, management team, people who are six percent less likely to want to join your business. Now, where you mentioned about the recession looming earlier, there's gonna be obviously m and there's gonna be people losing their jobs. The, the data, which I shared earlier, about the rising jobs around data engineering, real estate SaaS, but those jobs for key strategic hires are still going to be in demand. However, you also need like the younger generation, the millennials coming in, and they're going to want to go work for like a cool, uh, young, vibrant, diverse company. No, very few people want to work in a traditional real estate uh, white male sale company. It's not exciting. It's not like going to. It's yeah. So people will look for different things, and it's a new employee value proposition. It's culture. It's then it goes back into the smart buildings. It's health and well-being. Are you in a healthy building? What are the other amenities? Amenities, amenities um, <laughs> that um, that the that people offer. Like before, I think I did lose people just look at base and bonus. Now the bonus might not be there. So how else do you attract the really good talented people? What are Facebook and Google doing? They are offering so many new things. Fine people are now doing remote work, but the but some of the big tech companies are still are doing sort of three days a week. So it's like, how do you find the balance? What are the actual perks when maybe the bonus isn't going to be there anymore? Which is super interesting to see. That's amazing. 
want to talk about a small thing called integrations, the APIs and the similar. Uh, one of the things that are big today, very, very big, because if you have technology, it's very, very nice. Can you be integrated into other technologies? That makes you king if, uh, on that aspect. And some companies are obviously are putting themselves in, you know, in the market as integrators. That's what they do as an operating system. You have all kinds of those. Uh, uh, what is your take on, I'm very curious to hear, uh, Louisa, what is your take on that one, um, on the integration aspect of the business? Well, we, um, well that sort of, uh, Zan, that's sort of my sort of point I was making earlier at Realcom. Like, uh, that was actually, we met like quite a few businesses um, that were doing a good job of that. And a lot of the, our clients on the uh, agency, Asimant side, they're all saying they want like a product to just help them sort that challenge out where they're using so many different products and to have a str- have struggle integrating it, not only because they don't have the in-house capabilities to properly do it and roll it out, but equally there's, it's just a bloody nightmare. The processes aren't there. The systems aren't fully there in-house and externally. Zan, is there anything which you want to build on on that? Yeah, I think what's interesting is that going to the likes of Realcom is that often there are lots of conversations going on about the problems that they're solving in ESG or the problems that they're solving Mm. in um, energy management systems. And then at the same time, you've got the, the... you know, the operators or the landlords or the owners or the developers who are saying, great, we want this, but we need to be able to have it from a single pane of glass. So there's, 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 there always seems to be a slight, uh, I guess, shift between the two groups where you need to have, um, collectively, there needs to be a solution to, um, to gather all this information, be able to offer it um, in an easy format so I think there's 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 a massive amount, and there are some companies out there that are doing it. But I think that there's there's a definitely a massive opportunity here um, for for people to be able to come together and collaborate um, in that integration piece. But I think what's interesting is that you know while there is still um, potentially not that um, uniformed integration, there are lots of companies that as a result have you know are able to access you know new revenue streams whether that you know from a consulting aspect uh which kind of feeds off (laughs) ironically this inefficiency of efficiency within real estate technology um and you know i think that will always continue you know we work with lots of people that that do work on yardy implementations from a consult uh, consulting practice new technologies that start up that work on you know energy efficiencies there will be people who are specialists within that so I think there will never be a perfect um, like integration for one and all, but there's definitely more work that, that needs to be done there. John, uh, I want to ask you something. You're in New York. The walk and talk about recession coming up, and we touched that a little bit, but I, will, I would like to hear from you. Um, what is the walk and talk in terms of the commercial real estate industry, and how do you think it will affect uh, the prop deck, I meaning it's a drop-down type of uh, – type of, a, uh, I guess, reaction. Uh, yeah. how, do you, how do you see it? What do you hear? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, you always say that misery likes company. And I think people like to talk about recession <laughs> more than anything else. They'll probably talk themselves into recession before <laughs> it actually happens. And I think that, You're right. you know, you know nine, 12 <laughs> months ago, COVID was the worst thing that ever happened. And then we saw, you know, so much innovation that, that came out of it. There's many companies that, that was started. I know that you were mentioning earlier, Yishai, uh, a number of businesses, you know, Microsoft for one that came out mm-hmm. of a recession. Um, so there will be innovation as a result of recession. You know, when the, the belt starts to tighten, you have to become more productive and innovative. Um, I think that there is, you know, certain companies that are that are actually missing out on great opportunities from a talent perspective mm. by holding fire over the next like two, three months. So we've spoken to some that are saying, we're, we, you know, we might pause for now, whereas others are aggressively looking for people. And actually there are people out in the market that are looking to make moves into interesting companies. And I think that while there are, we've seen adjacent industries, you know, if we look at the FANG stocks, you know, the Netflix of the world, the Facebooks, who are putting the you know pumping the brakes on hiring those businesses have grown dramatically over the last 10 years and potentially you know they were overinflated stock prices you know some fintech businesses that have grown massively 
Um, and that's a reason why they're starting to get rid of, uh, of employees. But actually, the, the prop tech sector is, is, is very much in its infancy. If you look at the amount of investment that's between seed and series B is huge in comparison to other sectors. And I think for that reason, uh, there's going to be continued growth in the sector. And not only that, but they're going to benefit from potentially this, this excess um, in, you know, employees or um, candidates that are coming from adjacent industries with potentially crossover and transferable skills um, that fit nicely into the, you know, the, the fintech real estate market. And I think that will benefit, you know, what right now, the past six months has been a very candidate driven market. They'll have more opportunity to take uh, or cherry pick uh, more talent. So I think it's a, uh, it's definitely dependent upon the mentality of, of your mm. founders and your investors. So I think you can, you can decide to either, you know, hold up and, uh, you know, ban down the hatches, but there will be other companies that are, a starting up during this, you know, during this potential downturn, or also aggressively going after um, their growth. And if you're stuck by the wayside, you're not innovating your product. Then actually, I think you're going to have a hard time coming out of it um, when the taps turn on and everyone wants to do business with you. So I think that's a really important aspect to think about: is like, what is your strategy going to be over the next six yeah. to nine months? Because a lot of people are, st- are still pressing go. Hundred percent. Uh, you guys, we're getting to the point where we have to say our goodbyes. I could speak about PropTech with you guys for like three days, just <laughs> like that. It's just so much fun. So I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, you guys are listening. We're here with Louisa Dickens and with Zan Winterton from LMRE, an amazing company that started with PropTech. When PropTech pretty much was PropTech, they are there helping everybody uh, with placement, with business development, you name it. And uh, you guys can see the links above, below. Uh, Guys, if you want to tell us how they can find you. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Go to lmre.tech.com. Com is that it? Oh my god, I haven't seen my email just out for ages. <laughs> just, that is that? It's, oh it's, I'll, I'll come in and save you, Lou. It's just lmre.tech. Uh, so god. head there. We're on that website. Um, lmre.tech. Re- yeah, maybe don't reach out to Louisa. She might not. She, she might not know where she is. <laughs> um, <laughs> or you know, find us on LinkedIn. Um, shoot us an email. We'd love to chat. Even if people are interested interested in just learning about the the sector, if they're not they're not in it already. Um, we'd love to have a conversation. That is Thank beautiful. you, Zan, for saving the day. <laughs> 100%. I loved having you guys, and uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, Ashai. So Thanks stick for around us. for another Thanks, minute, and I'm going to say goodbye to everybody. Guys, I hope you really enjoyed this conversation and you learned something from it. There's much to learn. I even suggest you take it back and listen to it again because you learned I'm sure you're going to learn so much from it. Um, And of course, I'm going to see you guys in the next show. Take care of yourself.